have in here. This is my final session for my role here. Um, That's great. It's been a busy day, which is great. Are you having a good time? Yes. Are you having a good conference? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good. 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 I had my first Dr. Pepper float. Oh, I yeah. missed it yesterday. Good. They need more Dr. Pepper. Yes, they they do. do. We bring our own, bring our own Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're yeah. pouring in Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're not exactly what I call floats. Did that get on the video? They're more like just, just, just yeah. ice cream <laughs> with Dr. Pepper. Yeah. 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 We got inspired a few weeks ago to make some homemade ice cream. We were really. It's a good inspiration. Oh, it was, it was good. It was great. That was a perfect kind of that. There's different ways of doing it. You know, but that was just what I like. Come on. So this uh, session, keys to success, is going to be if you've been at the eight o'clock or the recent session. The first one this morning was really um, just had a lot of information about millennial culture. Some of you were there for that. Um, and then the last session was how we respond to that culture. What are some the intangibles of the youth choir uh, experience? Uh, what are some ways to make those intangible, powerful qualities of the youth choir experience tangible and have an impact in what we're doing? This session is a very nuts and bolts session. Um, there's some oh, there's some how tos. Well, I think we we touched a few how tos or get some ideas in the other. Uh, the recent session, but this one we're going to unpack uh, passion programming preparation presentation. I was really on this alliteration <laughs> thing. If uh, the last one, relevance R's, relationships, the R's, I don't know, I'm bad to sit hard. What can I say? You know what I mean? Well, you keep pastor. that up and you'll be preaching. That's right, that's right. Um, so, anyway, that, this is kind of where we're going to be going in this session. And so, to get us started, of course, I'd like to hear from you a little bit first. Describe a moment. Uh, Describe a moment, oh, that's a misprint there, where your youth choir experienced some form of success uh, in ministry. I reworded re that, so it was you type of something. But describe a moment, if you have a youth choir, how many, by the way, let's start there. We have a new group of people who has a youth choir. Okay, good. Uh, can some of you maybe offer an opportunity where you felt like you had some success? What was that like? Um, just this past year at Pentecost, I used Brian Heen's um, <coughs> drumming book, and he has a little thing about Pentecost, and we, <coughs> I broached it to the pastor, who said, okay, let's give it a try, and I did it enough in advance, but I thought, if this is going to fail, I'm going to know early with my kids, mm -hmm. but I even purchased six more djembes, made sure each one of them had a djembe except for the speaker, and we led his drumming um, Thing. I kind of rewrote a little bit of it uh, for Pentecost as our call to worship. Mm -hmm. And I was a little nervous because <laughs> here you got eight, ten djembes in the front of the congregation, and they're all supposed to say, you know, <laughs> different languages. I mean, you know, oh, different see. languages come Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Maranatha was one, and yeah. um, Veni Espiritu was another, Mataka um, uh, Tifu uh, was one. Anyway, and I thought, I don't know how this is going to work. But I paired them in two in front of each section of the congregation, and the final two, the front, and then coached the uh, one little girl who did the speaking part. And prepared the congregation ahead of time and made little scripts in different colors for the different sections of what they were supposed to speak, the rhythm, uh, the phonetic, and what it meant. And um, I had people from the congregation who came up afterwards and said, that was really cool. Oh, good. I really felt like I was there. Thank you. Cool. So the, the choir did a, a wonderful, um, they, they did a wonderful job. They were so into it. They were so excited. Mm -hmm. Very what good. song did you have them do? It was just a Pentecost drumming. It was no singing choir. for my my youth choir then, and um, so I taught them, and I actually got in another um, <coughs> youth because we were drumming. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping to keep her this year. 
don't know, but I'm planning on using drumming again in there. <laughs> but um, they loved it, and they uh, it was a different way of reaching out and, and grabbing all of them, and they responded beautifully. So they were really good. Mm -hmm. We, uh, last month when we were on tour, we were at the Arkansas Food Bank in Little Rock, and we were volunteering for the morning three-hour um, shift, and uh, 40 in the choir, and you know about 60 in the total group of adults and everything, and, and um, so in an hour and a half, we knocked out all the work, mm -hmm. and the guy said, well, that's all we had, I mean, that's what we wanted you to do, and I said, well, we're, we can be here till noon and we really want to work so they reset everything and we did it again <laughs> and um, took about 25 minutes and then, then we did it again and we were leaving I was walking out with the guy and the kids were on the bus and he said we've had lots of groups here he said but I have never had a group that was that worked as hard mm -hmm. and was as nice as your your teenagers mm -hmm. And uh, that was, of course, that's the thing a choir director loves to hear, you know, mm -hmm. me. And moms and dads love to hear that, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and that had nothing to do with music. But uh, it was a really neat moment. Anybody else? That's awesome. Um, yeah, we had a, one of our youth. Actually, his uh, six-year-old brother died of leukemia last summer, and so I mean he was devastated because his little brother was just that was that was his little man, and uh, so our youth choir actually they took it upon themselves they sang at the little brother's funeral, and yeah I mean it was it was hard, and I was up there conducting them and. I mean, I was just like, I was bawling and conducting because I taught the little brother in children's choir and the kids were up there and they did better than I did because I was just, I lost it and they just kept going. And I mean, they were the ones that got together and decided what song they were going to do and they came extra time to rehearse and get it all together. And it was just, it was really cool to see them pulled together like that. <laughs> Oh, like, can, that made me think, can I, can I tell you about a song maybe you know of that would be, it's a, if you ever have, wow, that's powerful, but a, an anthem, uh, Dan Forrest is called The Lord of the Small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you heard these? Yeah. Lord of the what? Lord, Lord of the Small. small. It's, yeah, it's one of those, if you ever unfortunately have such a tragedy, mm -hmm. and you have an opportunity to present something musically, you have a part in something, that's, that's a go-to piece for the modern ministry. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to skip that. So this idea of success, and it's interesting, we had a musical ex example, and then we had a, a service example, and we had a, a ministry, an intangible ministry example there, you know? Uh, this idea of trying to nail down, what does it look like to be successful? Keys to success. We're trying to, okay, what do we do that helps us make those things happen? Uh, here's a quick official definition. The accomplishment of an aim or purpose, the attainment of popularity or profit, a person or thing that achieves desired aims or attains prosperity. And, and with that in mind, we, we want to have this question here um, that's kind of guiding our thoughts a little bit. How, do, how does a youth park plan for success? Um, in my experience, I, I've submitted the four things that you've seen on, on, as a subtitle. Um, I think they're key elements to having a successful program. Um, whereas the second session we just had kind of is the foundation and the framing of the home. These are the, are the walls, the drywall, the flooring shades, even the decorations, the curtains, I think that help the uh, full youth choir house do and look the way it should. Um, this is, uh, you know, as I said, a little more of a nuts and bolts side. Uh, so these ideas, passion, programming, preparation, and presentation, we're going to unpack these. And I, I submit to you that the first and the last 
Um, I was thinking about this. In, in terms of trying to get people involved in what you're doing, those are the ones, passion and presentation. That's where you draw in kids. That's where you draw in families. They see that you're passionate about it, whether interpersonally <coughs> or they've heard your group sing. Nobody, this middle two is the behind the scenes stuff, right? You're choosing literature. We're going to talk about programming. Uh, preparation, how you're getting that music ready. And you could spend, as we, you probably uh, maybe thought, we could spend a whole session on each one of these. Uh, so we're really going to be skimming the surface, but uh, hopefully have some key ideas here uh, for us. I want to line on passion. Uh, maybe you've picked up I have a little bit of passion about this. I hope you have. Um, and I hope you're passionate about it as well. We're all passionate about something. Uh, so let's talk about that. Passion. Though. Let's, let's start there. Because uh, it guides everything else that we do. Um, think, just for a minute, think about people that you consider to be passionate. Don't tell us anything. Just, just reflect for a minute. People you know now or that you've crossed paths with, uh, crossed paths with in the past. Uh, and think, what, what made them passionate? Just kind of think about that for a minute. Or, or more personally, do you think you're perceived as being a passionate person? Just to stop and consider this topic to us as individuals. And, and let's just chat for a bit now. How, when, where, whichever one. Have you seen people exhibit passion? Now, feel free to offer a response. Going to the mat or something. Okay. Yeah. Hill to die on, right? Kind of situation. Yeah. And I think it's a connection of heart and head. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you mine. And you might be thinking, oh yeah. I mean, I'm growing up in the South, football. I mean, how do you not see passion at a football game? I mean, you see some of the most unbridled passion. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. What's the difference between passionate and crazy? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, uh, that's that's a good place, right? I mean, just rabid, passionate football fans, or, or another sport. They, mm -hmm. I love football. Okay, so a definition here: strong and barely controllable emotion or a state or outburst of such emotion, or an intense <laughs> desire or enthusiasm for something. Official definition. And this is helpful, too. There's a lot of synonyms for passion. Look at this here. Pick one or two and write them down that you think kind of jump out at you. One that does for me is zeal. I think of the scripture passage, the zeal of the Lord will do that. You know? Fieriness, fervency, are you fanatical? <laughs> Fanatic, I should say. Yeah. Mania. <laughs> Fixation. Fanaticism. Oh, that's a good choice. Interesting. Now here's what's even more important. To, uh, to find out what something is, it's often important to describe what it's not. So what's the, an antonym? This one jumps out at me, and I picked one out of this from this whole list. That is apathy. I hope you've not ever found yourself in feeling apathetic about your ministry or serving. We'll, we'll have seasons, maybe we're just oh, finding inspiration is difficult. But about youth choir, we cannot be apathetic if we want it to be successful. Well, I had a middle school pastor one time. He said, um, "There is no neutrality when it comes to the gospel. You, you have." There is a decision. You cannot be apathetic about the gospel, either with it or not. So passion. This is the why of what we do. This is the why of youth choir. It's finding the answer. Why is youth why youth choir? And passion has got to be part of that response. 
we're trying to answer that question of why do we do what we do. And here's the thing, I, I think it's important. It, it is, the music is a vehicle for something much greater. It is not the end goal. It's not the end game. Uh, remember, ministry is about people, right? As we, we discussed in the lunch forum, uh, we reminded uh, the lady mentioned there, we're not teaching music, we're teaching people, right? Key statement. And the same goes true for us. We're in the choral music business, and the choral music business is a people business. And youth choir is young people business. Young people choral business, right? Very important for us. A couple quotes. The main concern of the choir member, this is Carol Simmel, director of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I love this. The main concern of the choir member should not be what he, uh, note he or she is singing, but answering the question, why am I singing at all? <laughs> Howard Swan referenced uh, in Mike Scheibe's sessions, sessions a few times yesterday. Our responsibility as choral musicians does not stop with the teaching of music. We must find time and energy for thought and study so that we can teach people how to live. When a mutual and sympathetic understanding of the human spirit is built, people finally can become persons. I mentioned that one in the previous session. You have to have passion in order to do that. Right? Passion about people, the people business. All that, I, I thought, you know, the definition earlier was good, but I wanted something a little bit more specific, and so I, I landed on this. And I, I, I tried to pare it down, but I think it encapsulates what I really wanted to say. My definition, passion. And think of this in terms and application to the student choir ministry. A fervent, determined, systematic, care and concern for a specific goal, or you can say task, demonstrated in purposeful, focused, and enthusiastic action. A fervent, determined, systematic care and concern for a specific task or goal, demonstrated in purposeful, focused, enthusiastic action. You can go a lot of, look at a lot of different arenas with that kind of definition of passion. Okay. Here's the truth, key truth, making this personal to us. Because it starts with us first if we're going to have an impact in our choir. Your passion, it fuels everything. It fuels your life and your work and your ministry. And as you probably know, I hope you know, it's contagious. You've been around those people that are passionate for life. It's hard to not be influenced or affected by that in some way. On my teaching evaluations, this is one of the marks that I get very nice comments. I mean, they can do a rating thing, and then they can offer comments. And I get the comments, there's always those negative things. But the positive, mention passion. You know, the great teachers, you'll hear students talk about, they're, they're great in their field, they know the discipline, but that's not enough. They have to be passionate about teaching. They're passionate about their students, and that comes across. And when they're passionate, students want to learn. That's the game changer in the, in the classroom, is passion about your field. So try to find your passion. What are you passionate about? What keeps you up at night? What occupies your, here's a good one, time and money. Adrian Rogers said that. If I want to know what you're passionate about, he'd say, I want to look at two things, your date book and your checkbook. <laughs> then I'll see where your passion and where your heart lies. What excites you to wake up each day? Those are some questions that kind of get the ball rolling as you think about this uh, personally. Really important. It fuels what we do. Now, applying it to ministry, applying this to your youth choir ministry, or if you're wanting to start one your future youth choir ministry, think about it. Are you zealous? There's that one of those words. Are you zealous for your youth choir? Are you zealous for that ministry? Are you zealous? This is a penetrating one. To maintain the tradition of a youth choir, or are you zealous for the actual students in the choir? That's important. And then think about this. You're, you're thinking about your own passion, but think of the students you have. You have, you have somebody that you think is a really passionate student. They live with a lot of fervor and zeal. Those students usually stick out. I think it's just important to... to your passion could influence students, but some students you might have that can influence others. Here are some marks of passion for the youth choir. And you're thinking, you're not worried 
but I like this, you're regular, there's a con word concern. You're regularly concerned about its health, its well-being, and this word legacy. You got something going, but is it sustainable? And you're concerned about that. That you give time to all of its aspects, all the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts. You've made time for selecting music, for rehearsal prep, calendaring, and really important, you've made time for student investment. That's hard. You got your own kids, you got your own wives. Finding time to connect with students is hard, hard, hard. A little bit can go a long way and make a big difference. Are you investing in leadership development, mentorship? Do you give time to those things? Have you secured funding for it? Now, we've all been there, if you've got one, we're wanting, needing more budget money. That's, you just have to be, that's the going to the mat for it, right? I need this so we can do, do this. You're getting adult support. You're connecting adults to your students. That's huge. Be passionate about that. Let your love for the music show. That's a mark of great passion. Some of us kind of keep it buttoned down about our enjoyment of music sometimes. Man, music's fun. Let it show. And when they see that on you and in you, they, they want to respond to that. But more importantly, let your love for the students show. That is key. That's what's going to make an impact. They won't remember all the literature you sang that year. Hopefully they'll remember the key ideas, they'll remember the scripture, they'll remember some things about it. But what they'll remember is the way they felt when they were singing it, the way you made them feel, <coughs> the investment you put into them. All that, again, helps us just identify the why it is we do what we do at Youth Club. This fuels everything. Now, program. Programming. This gets now still is a, is a personal responsibility to us. There's a lot of different ways or things you might um, can think of programming. Uh, and that word is thrown out a lot in the choral world. Um, as an event, okay, you're programming, your program, here's what we're singing. I think of programming in terms of the process, not an event, but the method, the process of selecting music. Uh, this is key for us to have success. We've got to be passionate. Uh, and we've got to be passionate about finding the right music for our group. Uh, and there's a lot we could say on this. And so, again, we're just going to be skimming the surface. Um, but, but I think we'll have some good things here. Jerry Blackstone says this. The process from repertoire choice to final performance involves imagination, improvisation, and inspiration. I'm firmly convinced that what we do as conductors, how we shape rehearsals, what we stress in rehearsals, the pacing of our rehearsals, the specific tools we use to transform the ensemble from beginners to artists and the gestural language used to rapidly communicate this information <laughs> emanates from our score-based imagination. Our dream guides us through the intricacies of sound, vowel shape, rhythmic vitality, dynamic variation, and the myriad of other choices that come our way. You see, again, this idea of the process, uh, he starts the repertoire choice to the final performance. This idea of programming, what have we selected for all of this uh, to come forth? So programming, where passion was the why of what we do, programming is the what. It is what we do, we sing. We are a youth choir. We're a choir of students. We use music as a vehicle to transmit truth, to our students and the people that hear us sing. At the end of the day, it's what we, again, it's what we do. It's the first and foremost thing we have to do is sing, and to sing well. Um, it, it's, um, again, the idea of the event, yes, we want to put together a good program, but we're talking about here in just a minute, programming is the process we go about getting the right music. Key truths to me, but I've seen, and you cannot miss, is that this is where the choral battle is won or lost. If you don't get the right music, you're doomed. It's just hard. I yeah. keep not saying what it is, but I, I, I'd like to say it. Yeah. yeah. I'd like for you to add to this. I hope you'll be able to. Yeah. Some of the most effective literature that you have used was the youth class. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. It might not be for this. I would love for you to Sure, to sure. <laughs> I've got some ideas on that. <clears throat> they won't be mine, but I can direct you somewhere. 
this might be, a, you might be, whoa, that's a lot of time. But it's what we do. I spend my summer doing this, preparing my literature for the whole next year. 30, 40% of your time, I think this is, you just got to be thinking this way. It should be spent looking for the right literature for your choir. It's easy to just kind of, oh, I like that, or kind of, oh, I've done this before, I've done this before, um, and, and not spend enough time on it. But you gotta, you've got to carve out <coughs> the time for it. Excuse me. I'm convinced of this. Most choirs really never reach their potential because of bad programming because of, the ba of bad literature choices. It was either too hard, it was too easy. We're going to talk about some of those things in a minute. <laughs> so some principles. When we think about picking literature, a few things. Guiding principles, you got to remember. Got a program to your choir strengths and weaknesses. That means you've got to listen to your choir. Not just do what you think you hear, you know, respond to what you want to hear. Well, what are they really good at? What are their strengths? So what are the kind of voices you have? you got to know that. And sometimes it takes time to figure that out to the right literature. You want to avoid exposing weaknesses. Don't pick something with a huge, big bass part if you have no basses, right? Or a big high soprano. I mean, it's obvious stuff. It's just not, you, you're smart people, right? Yeah, so what you're wanting to do is avoid those exposing those weaknesses. And then something for us, you want to teach them something non-musical. We're teaching ideas here, a spiritual truth, some sort of lesson, wisdom. It's a launch pad, the text. That's key for us, right? The text is key. I, and I mention these because I've seen people just, this is where a lot of errors are made when I, I judge contests. They overpick. What do I mean by that? Well, they do it in two ways. Number one, they pick too hard of a literature, or if, not in contest settings, but I see people who struggle because they pick too much literature. It all might be great pieces, but it's in terms of difficulty and quantity. That's where they make the most errors. They try to do too much. Got to have 12 pieces. No, you don't. You can do eight better and have more music making happen, okay? That's okay. Uh, and it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a change in mindset for us sometimes. Uh, and then this idea, cutting your losses. You know this idea, this idea of um, just, it's not working. You started on it and it's just a bad selection and you gotta cut it. Other than beating a dead horse and it sucks the life out of everything else, you just gotta be okay with saying, yep, we're gonna pull it and just forget it. And that's okay. And because it saves you in the long run, everything else, quality goes up, where if you kept it, everything else starts going down, right? Uh, and it becomes a drain. The key here, uh, back to this program of the strengths and weaknesses, it's easy to, oh, I like that, it sounds great. The way the piece sounds and actually executing it are two very different things. It might sound great, but pulling it off may be uh, it just hearing it and, and actually doing it. Just, you got to remember those are two very different things. Um, what's this, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one right here. Sometimes this is just a this is just a pride issue. Oh, I thought we could do it. Uh, you know, you don't want to let it go. Um, just gotta lay it down, lay the pride down, lay the peace down, and, and move on. You know, that's okay. Uh, if you haven't done it, uh, I've done it before, and, and that's just the way it goes. But we want to select now music with adolescence in mind. So I'm going to mention several points here. Uh, I think a lot of us understand. But when you're looking for literature, this is a lot of different stuff. Just things I want to throw out. These I mention these because these are the common errors I see, I, I see and mistakes I've made, some of them, and mistakes I've seen other people make. There's other points maybe you can make about the adolescent voice, but these are the ones that kind of rise to the top for me. Sometimes the subject matter is too shallow or it's too heady. We don't want to sing trite lyrics. You know? We want to sing things that have meat. When in doubt, sing scripture. Always. Just if ever in doubt, go for scripture. Or at least scriptural truth. Uh, they'll pick something, maybe the phrases are just really too long. So breath management is key for the adolescent voice and being aware of that. They, they, there's certain limitations, just like there are with children. They're growing a little bit, but you have to just be mindful when you're looking at music um, that, you know, in terms of breath, they can make it work. Dense textures, you don't do some 6-8 part thing unless you've got the critical mass of people to do it. It's just going to be a struggle. You'll be beating your head against the wall, right? Um, it's just real, that gets really, really hard. Unless you know you've got that group. Again, program with the choir strengths and weaknesses, right? You just have to know that. Uh, but I, I've seen people make this mistake because they get out of college. Oh, I can do it. No, no, you can't. You don't have the, you're not in the acapella choir anymore. No, bad move. Uh, students like rhythmic and polyphonic challenges. A lot of times we stray away with the, oh, I think polyphonic is Bach. Well, we can't do Bach. I'm not saying do Bach. I'm just saying look for something that has some unique musical focus that is a challenge. Unique, that's a Michael Kemp term, UNF. Unique musical focus that's kind of woven through the piece, an idea or the way it's constructed, that's, well, just cool sounding. 
right? Or that's kind of fun to put together. Uh, and sometimes pieces, this is bad editing and arranging and composing, but they repeat sections and they'll have things that are changed that are different, like a subtle note, and it's just ugh, kids wow. once a week with an hour, good luck, okay? And they're gonna miss two weeks out of the month. You're just getting those changes right is really hard, so just kind of be aware of that. When you have, you have a, a lot of the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge formats, sometimes, you know, they just, you might find yourself frustrated. In terms of range, I wanted to throw this up here. Uh, this, this is what I've seen. You, you'll see subtle, uh, maybe variations on this in, in some texts. But what I've seen, roughly for these ages here, range is, remember, the, we're thinking the highest and lowest note. We're talking about the difference in tessitura, which I, I think probably most of us know. But what I've seen is that they'll pick a part that's too high, the sopranos or the tenors, or the alto part, or, or even the women when they're singing in unison, it's too low or the bass part's too high or too low. And these are just some, and I'm thinking above, I think you get, I didn't put the numbers up uh, in, the, in terms of the cl pitch classification numbers, um, but I, I think you have an idea. But the uh, ranges extend up and down just a little bit as they get older, uh, but don't push it, okay? Uh, this right here, the, I just see so those tiny tenor parts that are, you know, you don't want neck tight tenors. You know, they're going to try and reach you know, to do these high parts. Be careful of that. Um, it's, just, it's just not the best. They didn't put their voice in this place that it needs to be. Common errors, uh, uh, that's what I see here in terms of selecting for range. But tessitura is a separate issue. So think, this is what we call the average range. Where do all the notes lie? If you took an average of all the pitches, that's the tessitura. Not just a single high note and a single low note. But if you looked at the whole piece and did an, and just dropped them in, okay, this, there are this many high Ds, Es, Fs, whatever, and if you have a plethora of notes that are on the top half to top third of the range, that's, a high, that's in a high tessitura, and a lot of pieces end up doing that for a long period of time, and you've got to be careful. That's very fatiguing on the voice, okay? So you want them to, especially the women, you want them to explore the lower and the upper end, and you want all the girls getting up there. And the same, same thing with the guys as well, but, but especially the, the women. When I ever have a piece that says altos only, pff, just have everybody sing. Just get the girls singing out there. If it says sopranos only, get the altos on that part, because they need to practice singing up there. If they yeah. put, sometimes the editors put it, because it's high. In this age, the voice is developing in such a way that nobody's a soprano or an alto, okay? Just get them singing and developing that voice. It's, it's good for them. My mentor at, Greg, uh, at Southern Miss, Greg Fuller, he put he gave us this discussion on healthy folder planning. Two, there's kind of there's two sides of it, right? Music that renders immediate gratification, and then those things that involve delayed gratification. You want a balance of these things. Really important. Elements that are familiar, like harmony, melody, rhythm, things that they kind of understand or grasp immediately, and then those things that might stress their vocabulary in terms of harmonic sound, textures, whatever. Music they can sing immediately, and then music that stretches their skill set. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't have all pieces that do this, and you don't need to have all pieces that do this. You gotta have a balance. It's the Goldilocks method of rehearsal, of music right. playing, right? Mm -hmm. Just right. Not too hot, too cold. He says this. You want in this category, I love it. Music that feeds the singers. Ah, the audience, the conductor. Sometimes we have pieces like, oh, I really want to conduct that piece with my choir. Uh, and then things that feed the process here. The growing process, spiritually or educationally. I like this, a balance of these things. You can't maybe do a piece in all these categories, but maybe at least three, mm -hmm. right? A piece that's a cappella, homophonic, so on and so forth. Kids love, you, you might get scared of it because you don't know how to conduct it. But, as the rule goes, I can teach my choir. My choir can do anything I can teach them. Okay? That's the rule. They can do anything I can teach them. The same thing for you. You might don't don't shy away from pieces. If it challenges you, that's good. That means you'll get better too. You know. And do never oh never underestimate the power of music and singing. Oh my goodness, people think their choirs sound better when they sing in parts. I'm they learn more. It's harder. It is so hard to sing in unison because it explodes. I mean, you're out there naked on the on the dance floor. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody's got to be doing the exact same thing at the same time. Very exposing. It's good discipline. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have never heard those terms, I'm sorry, symmetric or asymmetric. So this is terms of rhythm, so like two, four, six, as opposed to asymmetric, where you got something in like so five, seven, eight, four, or five, seven, eight, or something, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
I did a setting of It Is Well. I'm do arranging. And for the ladies, it's uh, It Is Well, and I did it in 9 8, but it's 2 2 2 3. Da 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 dee 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 Kind of creates this water rolling effect. So mixed meter not. Mixed meter, yeah, exactly. And then all these places, tons of places. Someone asked about literature ideas. You've, you've been to these kinds of things. Uh, I want to encourage you to go to this one right here, QWeb. Okay? There's a whole section here, QWeb.net, uh, of anthem reviews. You might not do a ton of anthems, but I think you should try to do some. But in this, there's pieces that have been tried and tested and, and worked for student choirs. Okay? Um, and there's little annotations about, hey, this piece is great because of this, it does this, it talks about this, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so this is a really good resource. Uh, Randy Edwards is up this, and others have submitted anthem reviews, uh, and you can find those on QWeb. Okay, but don't underestimate the power of actually this one right here. Hey, you heard a song or something, and then maybe you go find a good arrangement of it somewhere. Okay, involve them in the process. Don't be afraid of that. You don't have to take everything you're going to say. Uh, Amazon Music, Spotify, anything you maybe hear. Well, yeah, okay. That doesn't mean I'm going to hear it as a choral version, but maybe you can go search for it. Maybe you might find something, and there's something that's recent that will maybe cross over, uh, and that you can you can get a good setting up. CPDL. CPDL. Thank you. Choral Public Domain Library. Okay. Free music. Print as much as you want. Now, there's a lot of things that are in public domain. What is that? That's older music. So there's like Renaissance music on there. There's Baroque music. There's classical music on there. You have to be very careful of uh, edits and the, the editorial versions of it. Sometimes they have mistakes or misprints or their formatting is not really good. Uh, so you have to kind of just comb over them a, a little bit more carefully before you select one. But it's great because it's all free and you can print as much as you want. And a lot of times there's short a cappella things on there by great master composers. Um, if you're unsure, there's a great book in terms of fine art music, Choral Repertoire by Dennis Schrock, uh, S-H-R-O-C-K, I mean it's a big old honking thing. Uh, but you could go through and there's all sorts of fine art composers if you wanted to do a piece by Mozart or Handel or, you know, what, what's out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a great book for you. Good resource. What's the name of it? A Choral Repertoire. And it covers beginning to <laughs> air quicker. <laughs> and time periods and locations and Danny, very Danny Schrock. Dennis Schrock, yeah. Similar to CPDL is the um, MSLP. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. IMSLP, thank you. I forgot about that. Uh, International Music. Uh, What's that? International Music. Something. Patrucci Library. Something. Patrucci, yeah. IMSLP.org. MP I M. Yeah, M is in mom. I M S L P dot org. Uh, okay, good. Flying through here. Oh, and also I have, and I put this in the insert. Okay, uh, one of my blogs I uh, did was this uh, article on programming that goes into this in a little different way. I've given it to you on your insert. Preach. Uh, I think it's important if we think of ourselves as a choir as preachers, right? I think music ministers need to plan music and services more like pastors, and pastors need to think more like musicians. <laughs> uh, preaching from the choir, hallmarks of effective programming. And so you have that there, and it was on the qm.net. But so we've got music picked out. How do we prepare? I love this phrase. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. Have you heard it before? Yeah, it's really good. This is the how of what we do. This is how we get ready. And there's a lot we could say here on, on preparation. We can have, a whole, again, a whole session just on rehearsal prep, that, this topic of rehearsal prep. I have a few things jump out here. Think of this first now in terms of your own personal preparation, because we're going to talk about ensemble preparation in a minute. But are you praying for your kids? Are you praying for your rehearsal? Are you spiritually in a place to be able to lead others, don't underestimate the importance of that. It's really powerful. I have in my life, and I, I see the difference when I've gone into rehearsals that way, and it's a big difference. Relational. You're working with kids. Have you connected with them maybe some way? Emotional preparation? 
all the baggage, hey, we're people too, we've got lives, we've got families, and you got to just kind of put that on a hanger for a minute, right, before you go into rehearsal. That's emotional preparation. The whole topic of score study, there's so much that's been written on getting your scores that you have now thoughtfully prepared and selected on how you get into them and know them intimately. Uh, Robert Shaw, Margaret Hillis, James Jordan, Elizabeth Green, Jameson Marvin, all these people, just Google search them, uh, and there's, there's various books and resources that you'll be able to find uh, where they talk about score study if you want to just dive into this in a little bit more. But what I say is just how are you getting to know the music? Because this is important. <coughs> to know the music well, how it's constructed, how is that just going to lead how you're going to teach it, okay? You've got to know how to break it down. But you've got to make some choices interpretively, right? How am I going to handle this passage? you got to know that. This is part of your preparation. Uh, you know your choir, so you know, oh, this needs, I'm going to have to have the, the altos maybe join the tenors here. Oh, this part, yeah, I need more people here. I don't have enough people on this part, so I'm going to do just the voicing here. So you're not going in rehearsal and saying, oh, that's not good. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, the minutes are bleeding off the clock. You know what I mean? So you've made those informed decisions ahead of time and it saves you time in rehearsal. And then, you know, we're kind of locked in maybe thinking what our choir should stand like. It doesn't have to be the same for every piece. Maybe it can change a little bit. That might scare you to death. And how do you do that? Well, it takes some massaging and some thinking about. Uh, but there's no reason you couldn't maybe move them on one or two pieces just to change it up a little bit. It's good for them. It's good for you too. And knowing the score helps you make that decision. I need to put my sopranos and altos together here as opposed to my sopranos and basses. So I want my men to the left or the right as opposed to in the middle on this piece. Okay? Rehearsal prep itself. This is important. I want to try to mention this quickly. I don't know if you do this, but this is really important. This is kind of my step process. Have you ever just, you should hopefully take your whole rehearsal schedule. This is what I've got. And total it up. This is how many minutes I've got. Okay? From, I've got my folder, I start here, say August, whatever, and i got to get to Christmas. This is how many minutes I've got. Then, with that in mind, how am I going to take these number of pieces and digest them over time? This idea of how do I eat an, el an elephant? One bite at a time. Some of us go in, we just kind of hope we get to the finish line in time. With much prayer and fasting. <laughs> that we get in time to the end and we're prepared. Mm -hmm. But you can lay it out ahead of time. One suggestion I have is work on the hardest to the easiest pieces first. Now, maybe you start at least look at one of the easiest pieces, but why here? This is the recipe that takes longer to make. Mm -hmm. right? So you need more time. These pieces don't need as much time to prepare. Mm -hmm. So why are you starting them at the beginning when you have all this time? Start with the hardest and then work to the easiest first. That's key. Then within the piece, do we always have to work front to back? And the end of the piece sounds terrible. Because we rehearsed the beginning over and over and over and over, we barely got to the end enough. But why not reverse it? Work back to front. And what happens? You work on the back, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Then you add a section in front of it, new, and then you go right in. See the continuity? Then you put another section in front of the train, and you keep going, and you keep going. And by the time you get to the first section, look how many times you've sung the whole piece through. Wow! Look at the continuity that you've built. And it saves you so much time. Or maybe you work in the middle. And then you start working on sections outside of that, and outside of that, and outside of that. Or maybe you put the hardest sections, if it's A, B, C, D, E, say we've broken the piece down in five sections. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty level is something like C, B, A, E, D. Maybe you work in that way. Why the hardest? Well, like we said here, those hardest sections need more time. And then as you get closer to the end performance time, you put everything in order. And the sections that need more time have received more time. And the sections that don't need as much time, you haven't wasted time overdoing them. See? It's very important. What does that look like for the ensemble? Breaking down the rehearsal process and what I call this, this three-phase process. The first phase is acquisition. What does that mean? We're acquiring, right, something. This is the basics, the raw elements. We're trying to get down notes, rhythms, and text. What do you think? Well, that's my whole semester. Well, we're going to talk about that it shouldn't be. If you do this right, I think you'll hopefully get into those deeper, more meaningful elements. Acquisition. This is where you're hopefully, you should be in fast pieces, working at slower tempos. You're probably in sectionals. Or I would encourage you to be in sectionals a little bit. 
Maybe you take your sections and you have it right. You're not just always sitting in seats or standing up. You're staying alto, so you stand over here in a circle. Sopranos, so you stand over here in a circle. Tenors, so you stand over here. Bass is over here. You got leaders in the middle of them. Maybe adults, maybe student leaders. They're singing their part. They're listening, and all of a sudden, there's this really dynamic energy in the room because you just moved everything around. Right? This is important. Before you even get in, spend time on the text. Start talking about the text before you play a note or sing a note, and let that guide this opening phase. Am I talking too fast? Then the retention phase. That is, we want to keep what we've done, but we're going to add now detail work and finesse elements. Many people make mistakes because they start trying to fix things here, but they're not even on the right note yet. They haven't got the right vowel select. You know, they haven't even got the right word. They haven't got the rhythm fixed yet. And until those raw elements are in place, these things will not ever be done right. Okay? So this, we want to move into the retention phase after the acquisition phase. This is where we start getting back into full group rehearsals more consistently. Maybe the whole group rehearses in a circle, no longer in sections. Everybody can hear each other. You've got the rehearsal space to do that. If you're working with an acapella piece, this is where you start removing the piano. And then the third phase is continuity. That is, we've got all, most of the piece, so the details are in the voice. But we want to get to this phase where we're working for now the consistency of details. This is key. Continuity of details. This is where we're hopefully doing some run-throughs more consistently. We're polishing, but we're in our standing formation now. We're no longer in circles. This is probably where we're memorizing and rehearsing from memory. And you have to be diligent about thinking of this way. Sometimes, we, again, we just think we're going to happen and get, and we're just going to stumble across the finish line and, and hope we get there. But this kind of breaks it down a little more of a systematic way. I think it's really helpful. And maybe when you're getting to the end, you take your choir to another part of the church and you rehearse. Just sing the, choir, just sing the piece somewhere else. They hear it in a different space, uh, in a different venue, and it just puts a different spin on it. makes it fresh. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they're getting, it's getting stale. Mm -hmm. Really, really important. And then also, don't underestimate the importance of when you're rehearsing, the body alignment. The choir is standing right. They know, if they're holding folders, that you're practiced. Choir, hold your folders. If they practice the piece for six weeks, eight, ten weeks like this, or whatever, they're, they're most likely in performance, they're going to do that. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. And we sometimes forget this. I, I didn't think about this much when I was first getting started. Rehearsing facial expressions. It's hard to get kids to be expressive. It really, really is. Uh, but don't let go on asking for that. How does the emotion feel in the piece? And rehearsing and practicing and making be aware of how to change if the piece has any sort of changes. For many people, notes and rhythms and text you guys are a point of arrival. Unfortunately, that's the truth. Okay? They think they've gotten there. We're performance ready. But, and careful here, I had fun with my PowerPoint presentation. Be prepared. Yeah. They are a point of departure. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, okay. that's oh. what you did. I don't want to tell you how many minutes that took me to get figured out. <laughs> but I was happy when I figured it out. But it's totally worth it. <laughs> but notes and rhythms are not a point of arrival. They are a point of the departure for greater meaning, for communication. For many of us, and I've been there too, it's just getting to the end to get to the notes and rhythms down. But hopefully we can get past that, okay? Now, this last thing, we're, we're just scooting to the end here. Everybody okay? Yeah, right. Megan, is this okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the kind of stuff I teach in my class, and I love it. It's great. Oh, fun. Presentation. That, this is one of those elements that I didn't really understand until I had a long-time colleague, a long-time teacher, faculty member at Lee, actually, when I was there, talk to me about this, and I, 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 he's been a bit of a mentor to me. Um, I didn't think about this in the, in the way he would describe this idea of rehearsing the presentation and how we do and present what it is we've worked on in rehearsal. Um, think about it. Programming and passion, th these are the focus on you as a director. They're your responsibility, right? Preparation, yes, we talked about your personal preparation, but really this puts the weight now shifts to the ensemble. Their importance of them pulling their weight and executing the piece. 
But I think it's important to think about presentations focused on the listener. That's key. All three of these elements are a part of the core music experience. Sometimes we focus too much on ourselves. Sometimes we focus not enough on ourselves and too much on the ensemble. Sometimes we forget about the listener. There's a reason a lot of choirs sing in semicircles. The circle's complete with the audience, right? They're the completion of that whole cyclical experience. And this is going to guide some of our thinking on how we make that happen. I love this. Joseph Swammerfeld, legend. In musical performances, the disconnection I allude to above has manifested itself in performances in which technical virtuosity becomes the only goals. And the music students, both theoretical and historical, very often stop short of musical considerations. Meaning, which I believe can only be ascertained by allowing oneself to intuitively reflect upon the human spiritual impulse of each musical gesture allows a song to happen because of the synthesis of cognition, intuition, craft and content, spirit and flesh, surface and substance are in play. The full form of a musical work of art is allowed to communicate, not to dazzle, not to impress, but to communicate. Then the listener's lives can be touched at the deepest level and be forever changed. It's very important for us. This is the importance of singing and a key to our success is presenting well. This is the win of what we do as a youth choir. When we get to perform, when we get to present, again, singing is what we do. It is a means to an end. We discussed some more important ends in uh, earlier sessions. But here's some things to think about. I'm not going to give you a lot of how-tos, how to present, but I think these questions will lead you to the answers that you need. What distractions can we remove to make our message clearer? This can have anything to do with how we walk in, what we're wearing, what their hair looks like, and so on and so forth. And even the distraction as far as, wow, those constants weren't together. Or that phrase was really out of tune. You know, you can do musical and then non-musical things. How can we enhance our program to make the message more convincing? Is there some way you can enhance what it is you're doing? Is there some way to streamline your program? Do you remember the concert last night? Did you see how it was streamlined? With narration, speaking. They took a section of the piece Mercy, and it was this recurrent motive that connected and wove through the piece. That is enhancing, and that is streamlining. That's the example of what I'm talking about. That impacted their presentation. And then I love this. This, uh, this hit me. How can we involve and communicate with connect with listeners to make the experience more communal? One way they did it last night was they came in from where we were sitting, right? The processional. How that senses, uh, generates a sense of connectedness when they start from with us or when they come out to us. So many choirs just sits like us and them again. But I've been part of choirs and we've come off the risers, down on front, as close as we can to the audience. And man, the synergy in the room is just whoop, powerful. It's like you're a part of them. They're a part of you. I've given you a really practical thing you might want to look through on your own time. I've put together, I just call it a uh, whim, distraction removal kit. <laughs> and this is for my choir. This is for the ladies of Lee. These are some things we think about. We travel. And we tour a lot. We go to churches that are different um, week in and week out. you see where it is? You found it? Okay. Um, and I, all the choir reads this. They're expected to read it, have a quiz on it. And these are things that I don't want to spend rehearsal time talking about, but these are some very really practical ways from how we walk in, how we carry. This idea of how we carry ourselves is really important. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to put all this down on paper. These are ideas I've had, I've thought of, I've seen, experienced, that help us really respond to these questions, some of these questions, really this, this first one right here, the distraction removal piece. These are decisions that I make, or sometimes the students have ideas about, oh, we could do this here, and go from this piece into this, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's something practical for you that, that you could um, maybe think about and, and read, and maybe it was helpful. Take and use what you need and discard what, what won't work in your context. 